So I went to Thailand again, and this time was in November of 1975. And we were flying uh, no bombing because the, the war was over officially in 73. But we were there in case things started up again, and, and we'd fly some surveillance or security missions as a base would close. We would fly overhead to make sure there was no rioting or stealing and so forth. And I was down in Bangkok as my wife was there with me as a non-sponsored dependent, and she had to get a upgraded or renewable visa every couple months. So we had taken a bus down to Baghdad, I mean to uh, Bangkok, and gone to the embassy, and she got her visa stamped. And we're in the hotel, and I see on the news that the Cambodian government has stopped a cargo ship, the, U the SS Mayaguez, for intruding in their territorial waters. And we're going to go bomb them we, where we think they are uh, on this island. I thought, my gosh, I'm going to miss out on another war. And I didn't get back home till the next day. And other people are flying, and I'm not. Oh, gee. And the third day, pardon me, they say, you and Royce Bowen, we call him Rolls Royce, you and Royce Bowen are going to go and coach as your call sign. You're going to meet a tanker over at the island, and you're going to drop four 2,000-pound bombs. Now, the 111 would take off with four 2,000-pound bombs like I didn't even know they were there. The wings come up forward, bombs under the wing, it just lifts right off. A lot of lift, not much power, but a lot of lift and a lot of speed. So we, pardon me, we get down over the island and there is an OV-10 doing the forward air controlling up and down the coast of this little tiny island. And he's just outside of, well, he's within range of the 50 caliber machine gun they're firing at him. A, uh, 14 uh, or a 12.7 millimeter or a 14.5, 50 or 60 caliber. And we can see the tracer shooting at him. And like a water hose, if you move a water hose, it looks like the water's curving. It's not. The water all went out straight, but it forms a curve. And that's what the bullets look like behind him. They're shooting at him as he's moving, and the bullets seem to be curving. But as you look, they seem to be curving more away because he's moving forward. Anyway, they never got up to him. They're always behind him, always behind him. And so we're watching him. The guy named Bob Undorf, by the way, whom I'd known in the staff college. I recognize his voice. And um, he's calling in A7s to bomb, F4s to bomb, like this big thing. And we've got a lot of gas. So we're staying up overhead um, the island and watching this go on. Then an F4 would call in. I don't have enough gas back up to Udorn. I need to get some gas. So I say, hey, hey uh, whatever the Bob's call sign was, Tell him he can take 2,000 pounds of mine. Hey, thanks a lot. He'd go up and get 2,000 pounds of fuel from the tanker and then come back down and try to bomb instead of going home, like he said. So I gave gas to, <clears throat> to F4s and to A7s, and um, we're up there bored. He says, Royce, you were up here yesterday. Yeah, he says, the little island up there, they shot at us with a 37-millimeter cannon. Well, let's go see if we can make them shoot at us again. So we went down to about 5,000 feet over the island, and no, they didn't do anything. So we went back up overhead. Finally... The last of the airplanes is gone, and I'm going to be cleared in to bomb. So I go out about 20 miles away to turn around and get down to altitude. I'm going to drop from 500 feet and go down even lower after, or two, I'm sorry, 2,000 feet, and then drop down as soon as the bombs come off. So I'll be out of their expanding, uh, you know, uh, force. And about that time, I start losing all my instruments. We lose the radar. We lose everything that was electronic. We lost. And then another guy calls up, hey, this is such and such, a guy named Bob Jones. We all give each other nicknames. We call him Jones for, you know, so Spanish, J-O-N-E-S. Uh, Jones calls up and says, he's here. I say, hey, Jones, let me get on your wing because we've lost everything. Here's the target coordinates. We give him the coordinates. He can put him into his automatic bomb delivery. So I get on his wing at night, just a few feet away, and we're heading in to the island. We can see the surf on the north side of the island. And just as we get feet dry over the, over the land, about or two seconds from dropping, the fact calls, do not drop, do not drop, go through dry. The last Marine is off the island. There had been nine Marines left that had crossed the island. They're being picked up. Three, and then three guys from the right come in to get picked up. And those three did not know there were three more over on the left. And they were left on the island. And they were later tortured and killed. But they thought the last Marine was off the island to go through dry. So Bob Jones was the next to the last aircraft in combat, and I was about four feet back and behind him as the last aircraft in combat in Southeast Asia. I don't know if I'll see Jones again, but if I ever do, I'll have to remind him he was next to last. So that's my story of that. And so the 130 said, I've got to drop it. I don't have fuel to get home. 
which probably wasn't so. But he says, okay, well, you're cleared in. There's your coordinates. And so we're, I don't know what he's going to drop. So we're over the island, still in a circle. So I roll over the side. Bob had gone on ahead. And I got my camera ready. I roll over, and the C-130 pilot says, bomb away. Not bombs, bomb away. So we wait and wait, and nothing happens. I push the throttle up, and I pull my camera back away and roll out and look back again. And this great big pink fireball just explodes with a fire or with a vapor ball around it from the dampness and humidity, and then it's gone. I'm like, gosh, what in the world was that? Well, it was a bluey something, B L U something, and it's propane. And so the forward air controller says, I give you 100 over 100, 100% 100 on target, 100% destruction. And say your ordinance, one fire propane, and the Ford Air Control says, understand one, five, zero, zero pounds propane, negative, negative, one, five, zero, zero, zero pounds of propane. That's a thousand barbecue grill, you know, they, you know, they're about 18 pounds. Anyway, that was a lot of propane and uh, it's a fuel air mixture. It hits the ground, doesn't do anything. It spreads out, heavier, denser than air spreads out and then it's ignited and takes just sucks all the air out of everything you know in a big shock but uh, i wish bob pardo were here to tell you the story earl almond who who we pushed in the other f4 has just recently died but those two guys two men in each airplane i wish i had the names of all four but i know that pardo is coming out from north vietnam and almond's airplane has been hit and is losing fuel and is going to flame out Pardo is right with him on the wing. Almond's airplane flames out and he starts down in the glide. Now, there had been cases where one airplane had tried to push another one. Um, there was a case in the uh, story and the movie The Bridges of Tokori where William Holden, the hero, his airplane is being lifted kind of under the wing, one wing under another, to get him out to the water of North, over North Korea. Doesn't make it, finally collapses into, you know, crash in the ground and is killed, it's tragic and all that. True story, um, but played by, by William Holden in the movie. Well, Pardo figures there's got to be a way to push him. So he tries different ways behind the airplane, and there's a lot of turbulence, and of course the, the exhaust from the engines, and nothing is working. He tells him, put your hook down, and the hook comes way down, down about like so. When it catches a cable, it swings, swings back, but it goes down almost straight. Pardo pushes the windscreen, his window in the front of the aircraft against that hook and pushes against the hook and is able to push this 50,000 pound, well, probably weighed 40,000 pounds then with no bombs and no fuel, pushes this airplane and they're heading south out of North Vietnam and into Laos. And then it breaks loose and bounces around and it comes in again and pushes them and and again, it, it falls loose, it slips over the windscreen or whatever, makes several attempts and finally pushes him until Pardo runs out of gas because he's using a whole lot. All four bail out, but they're down far enough now into Laos that all four are picked up. Well, the generals and colonels didn't want anybody to know about this because they thought it was foolhardy and shouldn't be done. People in World War uh, II did this with P-51s, um, a guy named uh, Bob his dad was a famous P-51 pilot, and I met his son. But his buddy lands, is shot down, engine quits, lands in the field, and his dad, oh, gosh, I know his name, lands beside him, gets him in, picks him up, and takes off. In Vietnam, in the Ashaw Valley, army unit there is under heavy attack, surrounded by the, by the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese being mortared, and they're trying to get air support into them. A-1s, the A-1 Sky Raider, has got 16 hardpoints carrying bombs and rockets and got cannons, you know, 50 caliber, and it's doing everything it can, but there's only two of them down there doing this. While this is going on, a guy named Bernie Fisher is one of the two, Jump Myers is nicknamed, Jump Myers is the other guy, a C-123, like our old airplane out here calls, I have got 10,000 pounds of munitions on board, but I can't get down through this overcast. And Bernie Fish says, I'm going to come up and get you. Be ready, right overhead, 
listen to my radio call because the needle will show where the radio is and DF, direction find on my radio with a needle. And when I get up there, you get on my tail and I'll bring you right back down because I know where I am. And he went down and with parachutes pulled out munitions that the army could use. And then Myers gets shot down and bellies in on this very short runway covered with perforated steel plant, P PSP, perforated steel plank, uh, planking runway, very short. And Bernie Fisher lands his airplane under fire, turns around at the end, turns out there wasn't much room because a bunch of fuel barrels at the end and shortened the length of that field, has the canopy open and turns around. And I, Bernie Fisher told this story. I happened to be at where he was giving a speech. He said, I'm waiting for Myers. I see him running out and I see, I know he's going to come up the back end of the wing and I'm waiting for him to climb in and land on my lap. And he's not there. And I got the throttle pushed up and engine ready to go, my feet on the brakes. I look back and he looks like a, 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 you know, a comic, you know, a cat trying to climb on the crawl on the wing because the prop blast of this 14 foot propeller is so strong that he can't get up there. So I throttle back, he climbs up and just dives over the canopy rail on my lap and we take off. Bernie Fisher got the Medal of Honor for that. Well, a lot of the wheels don't like this stuff being done. It's foolhardy and dangerous. So they didn't acknowledge that this had happened until long after the war. Finally, it became, became known. And Bob Pardo and, you know, got the credit and his backseater for the credit of what they did to save their buddy. It's called Pardo's Push. And if you never hear Bob Pardo tell the story, it's his story, not mine. It's, it's, it's a great one. Really, really superior. Yeah. Oh, the Band-Aid! <laughs> Somebody asked me for last week, in fact, did you know General Olds? And of course I knew Robert Olds. Uh, I knew him because he flew uh, our top cover, uh, our MIG cap as we call it, to keep the MIGs off of us. And he was really, really good. He would, oh gosh, if a, if a pilot would call bingo, I'm out of gas, uh, he'd say, go on home. You know, monitor your gas better, learn to fly. Because... Olds is the leader, but if you're number two and Olds is turning, you don't have to use more gas. You see him start to turn, you lift your airplane up a little bit, slow down, and just ease it over and come back down again. Uh, driving out here from, from Cape Canaveral, 30 miles coming out here, I got the, my uh, Hyundai Santa Fe up to 32.4 miles per gallon. My wife drives it, gets 25 miles a gallon. Slow, easy acceleration turn into the parking lot here without using the brakes, coast up the hill and then level off and park on the grass. Fly an airplane that same way. You can save gas by being a wingman over what the leader is doing. He has to use whatever he's doing. You can cut corners and so forth. Well, anyway, he was that way. One day I was flying. We are just coming off our tankers. We're coming in uh, up above Haiphong uh, from feet wet over the Gulf of Tonkin, coming in to head toward our target over north of Hanoi, 60, 70 miles away. Robin Olds calls, and these are the exact words. Hey, anybody over here by the dog pecker? A MiG-17 just went in. Who got it? The dog pecker was a distinctive bend on a, on a river. We all believe Robin Olds shot down his fifth MiG that day. But we also knew if he got fifth, five MiGs shot down, they'd bring him home. He was a double lace in World War II, P-38 and P-51. Married Ella Raines, a starlet, later divorced. That's another story. And we think that's why he did it. He wanted to give it to somebody else. My commander, who was leading us 100 miles away, starts yelling, I got it, I got it, I got it. I'm just despicable. The difference between one was a careerist, the other was a professional. Robin Olds is a professional. Anyway, we have started up an organization called the River Rats, Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association, guys that had flown north of the Red River in Vietnam. And... Olds and Scrappy Johnson, Olds was F-4, Scrappy Johnson was at our other F-4 base. He set a record of climb to altitude in an F-104, not rocket assist. Somebody else did one with a rocket on board. I think he got to 104,000 feet in an airplane, conventional airplane, no rocket. Uh, it was a, a record setting. Anyway, and he lived down in Jupiter Beach. He died at almost 100 years old. One of the things he said, I've got to keep interrupting myself, we were having a fighter pilot reunion, he was 99 years old, came up on the podium to speak to us, and as he walked over to the lectern, kind of staggering a little bit, you know, not too, like 99 years old, he comes up, puts his hand on the lectern, and says, you know the damn problem with getting too old? You can't swagger. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
If ever I give a speech at a, a reunion anywhere, I'm going to say, trouble with becoming 87 is you can't, or whatever I might be. Anyway, they started the River Rats. They just said, we've got to get together. Why are you guys going at 14,000? We're going at 12. Or why, why do we almost hit you guys every day as you're going here and we're going there? What's going on with this? Why are you here and we're there? So they get together and have a tactics conference and a good chance to drink a lot of whiskey. And they have a parade. They get elephants and they get the Thai waitresses in the club to ride on floats and so forth. And they have one at Uban where Olds was, one at Karat where Scrappy Johnson was. The third one was where I was at Tok Lee, Thailand in November. And um, I've just finished my 100 mission, so I got my party suit on, blue for my squadron uh, colors. I got my 100 mission patch. I got my Yankee Air Pirate patch. I got my uh, American uh, flag over here and so forth. And uh, our tech reps from uh, Republic made the 105. They're passing out free beer all over the base every, for everybody. It just And I'm riding, riding my bicycle. I'm riding with no hands. I grab a beer can, and the wheel hits a rock, and I just stepped off the bicycle with my beer, with a bicycle, with spinning off. More fun. Anyway, uh, so we have these reunions, and we have a formal dinner, and uh, it's all very formal, but we, we, uh, we have a toast to our buddies that have been shot down and so forth. We get back to the States, and we decide to have these reunions. I got with everybody I knew in 68 to, when I got back to Texas, everybody I knew had phone numbers for, called them and says, let's all go and meet up with Larry Pickett, who was our vice commander at, uh, in Thailand, at his house in Wichita, where they trained F-105s. And we'll meet up there at 6 o'clock on this Friday. I get in a T-37 to fly up there, and I got a maintenance problem with it. I don't get up there till 9 o'clock. The meeting's over. But I'm proud to say I organized the meeting that Pickett led to bring the River Rats to the United States. Our first reunion was in Wichita. And we had a hotel downtown. We had a, a podium and a head table, and everybody had a full bottle of wine in front of them. Uh, Phil Drew, who's our historian, he was a weasel pilot, shot down a MiG. He was the outstanding junior officer of all of the Pacific Command as a very young captain and a great guy and a very, very good friend. He's up there at the end of the head table, and somebody says, hey, Phil, you going to drink that wine? He says, no, why, you want it? Yeah, toss that down here. The cork had been removed. He tossed a bottle of red wine. <laughs> We're wearing white mess dress uniforms. I didn't get any on me, but other guys look like a shrapnel shot. You'll be in shot bloody. You'll pop up, pop up, pop up <laughs> with the wine. So it's a lot of fun. We drink all the wine. Some guys hide bottles under the table. Those are all drunk down. We emptied the bar of all they had in the little bar in the hotel. We drink everything they've got. There's not a drop left. The hotel staff have all gone home in disgust as we're all drunk. We're in a little ante room, oh, it's probably um, oh, 20 by 40 feet. And we got Robin Olds, we're talking about, who was a, a World War II ace and a World War II uh, fighter pilot. Um, 6'2", 200 and some pounds, all American, set all kinds of, got all kinds of records at West Point as a lineman, had his teeth busted out as a lineman, uh, really, really quite the guy, very powerful. We got my boss, General John Dorado, who'd been shot down and captured out of Italy and again in Korea. And these guys are both up for Brigadier General. And Old says, let's have a leg wrestling contest. And Big John Kahuna, the big Kahuna John Dorado says, yeah, okay. So they get down on the floor and they grab arms and get their legs ready and this captain over here says, I got $10 on the general. I says, you're covered. Which one? He says, mine. Which one's yours? The big one. Which big one? He says, that one there. That's mine. Well, old just flipped Gerardo right away, 220 pounds, just over like that. They get ready again, and Gerardo flips old right back. We all said, stop. That's enough. That's enough right there. And then old says, I want you guys to watch something you've never seen before. Two. World War II and Vietnam combat veterans, fighter pilots, Brigadier General selectees engaged in all seriousness in a barfing contest. I want two buckets and two bar stools. And Gerardo's like this. So they bring out the buckets and bar stools, a couple of little trash cans. Okay, come on, John, let's go. And he said, what are we going to do? He said, let's stick our fingers down the throat, see who can barf the most. He says, Robin, I, if I do that, I get sick. Yeah, you're probably right. Oh, hell with it. Never mind. Well, Bolo, Operation Bolo was devised by Robin Olds because MiGs were giving us a hard time. And they had the advantage of being at high altitude over bases that we couldn't touch. They could run into China and so forth. And while we're getting a lot of the MiG-17s, they're still bothering 
everybody, and the MiG-21s especially. And so Olds devises what he calls Operation Bolo. They're going to take F-4s, they're going to use our speeds, which are much faster actually going in low, because it's our, we're made to be that way. They're going to get at lower, our lower altitudes in our same formations in this electronic jamming pod formation. They put electronic jamming pods on the wings of each aircraft to plank the radar of the safer stair missiles. They have to borrow our pods because they operate slightly different than the ones they had on their aircraft. So it's going to be very realistic. They use our call signs not call signs like Olds used, Olds, Ford, Chevy, and so forth. And they're using our call signs. And they go into North Vietnam like they are us bombing. They got seven MiGs shot down that day. And they called it a MiG sweep. Sweeping in, taking out all the enemies. Well, they hold a MiG sweep up there in that ante room in the hotel. We're all standing around drinking what left is left to drink, draining the last of the wine bottles. And all of a sudden, here come must be 15 F-4 guys, all with their arms linked, smashing through everybody. I'm back five feet away from this wooden wall, your wooden your panel wall, and uh, I get hit by Olds right in the chest. And he comes under me right here. Well, he was longer from his right eyebrow to his shoulder than I am from here to here. And he smashed his right eyebrow right into that wall. He comes up laughing because mustache always, he had to cut his, and I still kept mine, not as big. But, and, you know, pie water, you blank, 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 a lot of bad words. Gotcha that time, you so and so. I said, oh my God, you're, I am bleeding. What the hell happened? I said, you split your eyebrow right open. Well, I always got a handkerchief. Brand new clean handkerchief. Stick that on his eye. Come on, somebody find a first aid kit. Find some ice. No ice left, no first aid kit. We get into the bathroom and my hand, my handkerchief is soaked. I start getting paper towels, paper towels, paper towels, hold it real tight. Uh, got my Band-Aid out, wherever it was. I had a Band-Aid out here. I got two today, in fact. Anyway, I got another one. I get my Band-Aid out and I said, okay, General, now hold your eyebrow together like this. And I put the Band-Aid across, right down on his eyelid and up like that, pinching this, I mean, gash like that. I said, whatever, don't pull it off because you're going to need stitches if you do. And so keep it on there. All right, okay, I got it, I got it. Well, I see him about five years later at a graduation of, of, from pilot training. Uh, no, it wasn't that, it must have been three years that I was still down there at that base, two or three years. And I meet up with him. We're all in our beautiful mess dress uniform, you know, black formal jacket and so forth and all our ribbons. And he's greeting and meeting the, the student pilots. He's spoken at their graduation. I come up, General Olds, how you doing? Pile out of you, blankety blank blank. You still got your mustache. I said, my God, you can get a scar from that. He grabbed me by the front of my mess dress. And he's big, 6'2", like I'm 5'9", 160. You did that to me? And no, sir, I put the Band-Aid on your eye. What happened? Yeah, I think I remember that. Yeah, I did. I got it. What happened? He said, oh, I got home and I had my cap down over my eyebrow. And Ella saw it. I said, what are you doing with your hat on in the house? Ripped the hat off. I said, what happened to you? And ripped the Band-Aid off and split it right open. And if you see pictures of General Olds, photos, whatever, you will see a scar right down here across his right eyebrow. So that's the story of the scar on, on Robin Olds' eyebrow. Yeah, He's a, he was a wonderful, wonderful warrior. He came to our, he and Bob Pardo came to our thud out, the last F-105s to fly up at Hill Air Force Base in Ogden, Utah, February 84. Um, the next morning, after a wonderful, wonderful evening, we watched three of them fly. One was on a pedestal being dedicated. We were in a hangar bigger than this with an F-105 at the front of the hangar and above it, a 75-foot long American flag. Everything that was so wonderful in those times in my life was represented there. My flag and my airplane. Very, very moving. We got a lot of the history of the airplane, a lot of stories, a lot of wild, wild stories. Next morning, having breakfast, and I'm sitting at a table with Robin Olds and Bob Pardo. And one stays, says to the other, I think it was Pardo says to Olds, they lived in Steamboat Springs then, both retired. He said, you remember that place, the, uh, the Adobe Bar, something like that, in Alamogordo, New Mexico? A couple hundred miles away. Yeah, he says, you remember how beautiful the the sunrise over the mountains was down there out of the desert. You can look and see that sunrise. Let's go down and watch the sunrise. They left a bar, left their wives, drove all the way in a Jeep down to Alamogordo to watch the sunrise. And that's, that's those guys. We're just wonderful, wonderful warriors. Wonderful warriors. Another one, Billy Sparks, got over 100 missions, uh, got about 140, got about 50 or 60 missions. He went back to Nellis Air Force Base in, in uh, Las Vegas, became a weasel pilot. And he came back. He said, with the bravest man in the Air Force, Carlo Lombardo. He said, Carlo 
was in the Army Air Corps as a uh, electronics guy when I was in the second grade, he said. Now, Carl was in the back seat of an F-105, listening to the warbles, looking at the scopes and so forth, and directing his nose gunner, as Sparky called himself, against the SAM, and staying up there fainting against the SAM until the last moment. And they just were a wonderful team. Well, it's decided that we need people know what they're doing down at the 7th Air Force headquarters in Saigon. So Colonel Bob White, first X-15 pilot to fly over 50 miles high, leader of our strike on the Doomer Bridge, volunteers to go, been in two wars already, but he knows they need somebody like him down there with authority. And Carlo, who's been in three wars in the electronic warfare business, goes as well. So Sparky now is going to be just a strike pilot, just dropping bombs. And they're striking on Fukin Airfield, right by Hanoi, and Sparky gets hit. He says gets hit with a 37 or 57 millimeter cannon shell up in the front of the airplane. Breaks, some breaks into the cockpit, catches on fire. He loses his radio, loses all his systems. Um, fire starts coming into the cockpit. The canopy is two layers of plexiglass. The outer layer melted through. The inner layer melted through. The right rudder pedal falls off. A lot of magnesium burning. Um, he's on his way out. And an F-4 guy calls, because all the F-105 guys tonight, they said, I've got it on tape, that I'm, I'm having these tapes transcribed. I hope they can, probably can do it. I, one of the big commercial places tried it and got nothing back out of these old tapes I have. But oh, I've got a tape of somebody saying, hey, anybody down here at the west end of the ridge, look out, there's a Sam down here. The west end of this mountain ridge goes up to about 5,000 feet above the 100-foot plain out there north the northwest of Hanoi. And somebody says, no sweat, baby, it's just Sparky's airplane on fire. <laughs> And he bails out, finally gets to the Black River and across and gets picked up. He's landed in a thicket of bamboo and hurt himself between the legs. Uh, he's picked up, given a shot of booze uh, in the helicopter, gets back to the base, and he's in a bed for, for compression fractures they worry about on ejection, flat on his back. And <laughs> Vicki Nixon is brought in. Vicki is this beautiful, slender, good-looking blonde. She's the secretary to the wing commanders. Just arrived. And they bring her in to see this wounded hell, wounded, wounded fighter pilot. And she's, oh, you poor baby. She's, she's, don't worry, I'm harmless, he says, with an ice pack between his legs. Vicky was wonderful. She was uh, at our reunion, our, at our uh, River Rat reunion, she's got a party suit on, a, a orange one or yellow one for her squadron that Sparky was in. She's associated, everybody's associated with one of the squadrons. And I got a beautiful picture of Carlo and Sparky and Vicky. And their first day there, she lands coming up from, uh, from, uh, uh, from, from Thailand, from Bangkok, coming up to uh, uh, where we are, 100 miles away. She's brought up in the C-47, DC-3 like we've got. Some major brings her up to the stag bar. Stag bars then were strictly stag. No women at all except a Thai waitress would come in with a bucket of ice for the, for the bar. That would be it. Never anything else. And I'm in the bar. I'm off flying that day. And the bar is pretty well filled. Small bar. I'm at this end over here where the door goes off to the main dining room and where the waitress come in with the ice. One bartender. Guys playing dice over here, drinking beer here. And I'm way down here. Side door opens up. And broad daylight comes in. It's like a vampire convention. You know, we're just like that with a bright sunlight. And here silhouetted is this lovely blonde Vicki Nixon in this major. And I said in my command voice, she looks like a very nice girl, but I want to know what the, the round eye is doing in my stag bar. Major turned around and walked her right out. We didn't talk about it for a couple of years. I saw her in San Antonio, maybe two years later. I was over there on a cross-country flight. She came out the base, picked me up, went to her, to her apartment, had a glass of wine with her, talking, reminiscing. I remember the first time I saw you, Vicky. I remember the first time I heard you, John. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you should not. I didn't know where he was taking me, into a stag bar. You know, well, that's all over now. It doesn't exist. But uh, she was a lovely, lovely lady. For our, um, for our rat reunion, which was just a couple weeks after she got there, we are doing a songbook. And I know all the words to all the songs, so mostly, you know, the bad words. So, Vicki, I need you to type these for a souvenir songbook, a little binder. And she's typing away. She's a very good typist, and she's typing and turning. John, I can't believe you having me type all this stuff. I said, you're supposed to type it, Vicki. Don't read it. Just type it. <laughs> so, 
Uh, she was absolutely lovely. So I would sit at different tables. Most guys would sit all the fighter pilots together at one end. I'd sit at different tables. I'd meet up with mechanics, uh, tower operators, B-66 crews, whatever. Um, thought just really the thing to do. And uh, even in my days as a squadron commander, I'd go to the GI enlisted dining hall and I would find a single GI somewhere and sit with him, you know, how are you doing, where are you from, what are you, you know, what's your goals? Thank him if I knew what he was doing because it helps me in the air. So Lenong is singing a song, I'm at her table one day and another guy, I learned her name and told me her name was Lenong. I said, Sawadee Lenong? And she was just taken aback, how did I know her name? And she finds Sawadee Nuat Nuat for mustache. And um, I said, you sing a beautiful song, oh, I shy no can song. Oh, the Nong is beautiful song. Please sing, sing a song for me. No can song, Nuat very shy. Oh, please, please, the Nong. Today, Nuat by Vietnam. No song in my heart. Maybe boom, boom, I die. No song, make the Nong cry. Okay, the Nong can song one song. No more, one song. She would sing beautiful, lilting, light, lovely song. Oh, the Nong song so beautiful. What song say? <laughs> Song say Puying, girl, love Puchai mock mock very much. Puying love Puchai mock mock. Mama son, papa say, son say, no can marry, they die by self. Oh no, so sad. Oh chai, yes, oh chai nuat. Tai so tai love song, very sad. So a day later, you know, or two days later, whatever. You can sing one song, no can song, shy, you know, so oh please, yeah, same thing, you know, maybe don't song. She'd sing another song. Oh, so so beautiful. What song say? Hmm, song say Pu Ying Le Pu Chai Mok Mok, he have some other wife, she died by self. Oh no, <laughs> so sad, so very sad. Now my first wife was Japanese, she was in Japan while I was there. Died years and years ago. Anyway, I'm going to Japan to buy stuff for this fighter pilot reunion. I'm going to buy Seiko watches, which were very popular at the time, Sanyo little rechargeable flashlights, and uh, have patches made. I've got two weeks. I've saved my time off five five days a week. I mean five days a month is all we get. And the, I've been allowed to save ten days, go to Japan, see my wife, um, and buy all these, this stuff. And I come back with an ornate set of chopsticks in a lacquer box for each one of the waitresses. Well, the day I come back and give out the chopsticks, Lenong is, oh, before I go, I said, I know see you next week. Ten days, I, where you go? R&R? &R? I go R and R. You go Hong Kong, you go Bangkok? No, I go to Hapon. You go Hapon. Why you go Hapon? I have wives to Hapon. Oh, you might go, you big liar. You might go. No, it's Ching Ching, it's true. I have wives to Hapon. No, you big liar, big go. -hook. And uh, so anyway, I go, I come back, chopsticks to everybody. Lenong is not there. The next day she sees me. Sawadee Lenong. Sawadee Nuat throws my menu down. I was going to have number 39, please. And she storms away and brings my food, throws it down. Lenong can sing one song, Nuat. No can song, no more, Nuat. No song, never no more going to song, song. Please, please, please. Okay. Lenong can song one song, no more. So she sings. Beautiful, beautiful, lilting voice. Lenong, song so beautiful. What song say? Hmm. Song say, Pu Ying love Pu Chai, Mok Mok. Pu Chai have some other wife, stay hapon. Maybe he die, maybe she die. Oh my God, oh no, no, no. I just want friends. Well, got over it. I got invited to her birthday party. I got invited to a New Year's party that all the girls held and everything turned out okay. But oh my goodness, you know, just, oh, to have, uh, you know, that was, that, was, that was terribly sad. You know. Now, one or two of the guys did marry over there. It didn't happen very often because the girls are, were pretty young for the most part. And they put Sawadi Nip, Sawadi Nuat. Nuat, you can't touch Nip. Sawadi Nip. She goes, Sawadi Nuat, and hit me as hard as she could and ran off laughing. So everything after that was fine. Oh, my goodness. I get tears in my eyes thinking about, <laughs> thinking about that. But oh, they were, they were absolutely wonderful and so much fun. And to be invited to Nip's 15th birthday party was a, was a real honor. About two years later, he'd get a picture, picture book of uh, being there at Talkley. And uh, in that picture book, which I'm taking to our 50th real reunion, 50 years from the, from the end of the uh, fracas there, uh, was a picture book from Talkley. But before I'm, I donated it this October, I took a picture of the waitresses, includes Nip, Atsupi, and so forth. And it's a really nice. 
I bought a bicycle my first day there. I thought it was a new bicycle, uh, green with uh, a little uh, white trim on the back of the of the fenders, um, one speed, you know, and caliper brakes. And um, I thought it was new until I had a flat tire, and I found there was mud underneath the the fender. They just repainted and make it look new. And a buddy of mine. Uh, Mo Baker, who shot down the one I said that had his femur broken, he bought one also. I see Mo, I said, hey, Mo, guess what I did today? I said, I don't know what, what you did. I bought a bicycle, so we can drive around the country. And we did. Uh, he got a, had a Polaroid camera, and I got film for it. We take pictures of people out in the countryside, uh, school kids who never saw a picture of themselves before, and uh, mothers with babies who never had a picture, you know, and so forth. So much fun. Um, we, uh, I've got some recordings, in fact, of, of peddling around. We went out, uh, I remember one morning, we we're going to go out about 10 till 6 in the morning when it's cool. Can't go off base because it's a curfew. But we're just riding our bicycles out in the sunshiny day. Sir, curfew from 11 o'clock at night to 6 in the morning. Whose idea was that? Colonel Gerardo, the VD rate was getting too high. Oh, so he thinks bringing people back on base is going to keep him from staying out overnight. Well, what would happen? Everybody's got to be back on the base by 11, so at about 10.30, all the little buses, which are made on a Jeep frame or a Japanese car frame with long backs like the Jeepneys in the Philippines, they'd stop running. They don't have any passengers anymore. So there's a guy out there at 11 o'clock at night. He's stuck. What's he do? Where's he going to stay? So he finds some girl out there on the street. So our VD rate skyrocketed. So <laughs> Gerardo figured that wasn't too good an idea. But uh, Mo had a... Uh, uh, a regular bicycle like I did, and then Pappy stole one of the backseaters um, who was there when I arrived. He bought a very nice modern American three-speed bicycle, it was, uh, red, uh, metallic red, for his daughter. He could take it down and ship it back when he left. And so we would loan, when, when we went on R&R, five days to go down to Bangkok or whatever, once a month, we would loan our, give, give our bicycles to the girls. And Nip and At lived pretty close together off the base, and they would get my bicycle and Mo's bicycle. And one time I said something to Nip. I said, Nip, I'll go R&R &R tomorrow. You want, you want Nuat bicycle? No. Nuat bicycle, number 10 bicycle. Nuat have Poochai bicycle. Poochai bicycle, number 10. Poppy have Puyang bicycle. I love Poppy, mock, mock. I get Poppy Puyang bicycle. You know, and then that would say, no, no, no. I get, you know, they really like the girls' bicycle a lot. They were just, just wonderfully just brought so much joy to what was otherwise, you know, uh, uh, pretty deadly. You know, if somebody shot down every other day, we'd lose somebody. Probably you know, one every three days, we'd lose, we'd lose one of our guys. Yeah. But anyway, all in all, we did what we were supposed to do, and we did it as well as we could, and um, the rest of it's all politics. So anyway. <laughs>